welcome back to my channel. <laughs> Do you like my mug? Hold on. You like my big ass forehead? Got eye on Shkeo. Anyway. Hello and welcome back to my channel. My name is Hannah Ruth Savita, also known as The Woman in Wool. And on this channel, we talk about history and crochet and dress so that nobody sits next to us on the bus. And the reason we do that is because makeup and true crime is oversaturated, so I figured Irish history and crochet might be a little bit more accessible. Before we get started, I just wanted to give you guys a quick look at my latest project. Editing Hannah here. Good news. When I stood up and did this little modeling gig for you guys, the camera didn't focus even a little bit, so I just stand there looking like a girl going to prom in the early 2000s, and instead of me waffling you through this, I'm just going to put some pictures up and describe the project. So the project didn't turn out nearly as flattering as I would have liked it to. It's not as flattering as the original cider dress that it's based off of, but it is, I think, smaller and cuter and has a place for a very casual wear. It's very soft and very comfortable because it's made of a merino wool, and if you like it, you can buy it on my Etsy page, which is linked down below, or I can make you one in another color. I was really feeling myself in London here for a little bit, really enjoying taking pictures of myself and feeling like an idiot while doing so. If you ever want to get self-conscious, take pictures of yourself in public. Okay, I love you. Bye. Everything you see that I'm going to be wearing from now on will be available on my Etsy shop, which is linked down below. Right now everything's on Etsy, and it'll be on a website moving forward as soon as I get my LTD and can set up a website on an actual website. Good. Language already off to a good start. We're, we're running with it. Anyway, if you haven't guessed from the title, this video is going to cover the history and lore specifically of leprechauns, and more specifically that one viral video from like three years ago that said that they were somehow related to pygmies. I understand that this is late, but this is my channel, so leave me alone. Or don't. Please like and subscribe. Holy shit. But first, a sentence or two about myself. My name is Hannah Ruth. I'm originally from New York. In 2016, I moved to Dublin, Ireland, and now that's all I talk about. Just kidding. I also have a dog. So that's the other thing I talk about. On this channel, we talk about mostly Irish history, which is a phrase that I coined uh, that covers Irish history and all the kind of related histories that are linked somehow to Ireland and the Irish diaspora. That's kind of my special interest. I do sometimes cover other histories outside of that, but mostly Irish history has kind of been my bread and butter so far. Just a little update on me. I quit my job and I'm doing this hopefully pretty regularly now. So if you are a fan of the channel, all however many of you there are, I think like 19. <laughs> Thank you so much for being my writer dies. I really appreciate you and love that you guys like this content. So we're gonna be doing this more often. Hopefully we get a few new friends rocking around. All right, just to let you know, I'm not a historian on anything that I talk about ever or professionally educated on any of this. I am just a dweeb with an internet connection and a lot of extra time in your hands these days. So welcome. What we're gonna be working on today, meep. What we're gonna be working on today is a bunting for my new deck. I will put some footage of the deck or the balcony that I've been working on here. I am so happy with it. It's been my little side project as I finished up my nine to five job. I was working on that as well. My inspiration is kind of like pub slash pub windowsill. So hopefully that comes across. So why not put a little Irish bunting? It'll make sense. It'll make sense. Now, the topic that you all came here to see. So if you've heard of Ireland, there is a 99.99% chance that you've heard of leprechauns. And actually, it might have been that you've heard of leprechauns before you even heard about Ireland. So this island of Ireland itself that covers, when I say the island of Ireland, I mean Republic of Ireland and also Northern Ireland that is technically a part of the United Kingdom. So I'm going to call it the island. You know what I'm talking about. So here on this island, there is a rich history of folklore and mythology. To be honest, the main character for the last hundred years or so has been leprechauns. You might have seen them grace shop windows and decorations and pubs for St. Patrick's Day. You might have also seen them running around on a stag do once or twice, being absolutely hammered if you live around where I live, because that seems to be a really big thing, is to dress as a leprechaun for your stag do and run around the temple bar area. To each their own. Yeah, but drag queens are the problem. The stereotype of a leprechaun that we have is like a chubby, jolly little man, like a little Santa Claus with red hair and green clothing. He's desperate to protect his gold, which he definitely has from clever humans like yourself. His methods of trickery are kind of harmless um, and lead to no more gold than what you actually started with. Another commonly known fact is that they leave their gold in the end of rainbows, but that they all have gold. All Jews carry gold in a little bag around their necks. Hand it over. These are kind of the generally known facts about leprechauns. They kind of waft around a certain time of year to remind us that they exist. But friends, as always, things are not always what they appear. And these little feckers are not only just some harmless fairy tale, but come from a long and complicated line of mythology and folklore. And that folklore starts with the actual lineage and the origin story of Ireland itself. Actually, this is the mythical 
uh, origin story of Ireland itself. So number one, what is a leprechaun? Where does this stem from? So leprechauns are actually just one race of many creatures that belong to a kind of a magical grouping of characters, let's call them. And this grouping of characters is... Da -da -da -da, fairies. That's right, a leprechaun is actually just a fairy, or a type of fairy. But in Ireland, fairies actually have a much longer and more complicated um, relevant history than maybe what you're thinking of or what you've potentially read in childhood books. And fairy is actually more of an umbrella term that the Irish use for this magical group of creatures. Fairies are descendants of godlike creatures called the Tua de Danann. These guys were the original inhabitants of Ireland and were actually descendants of the previous leader of Ireland called Nemed. Descendants of descendants, lots of godlike creatures and magical beings. The Tua, as I'll call them, or as many people call them, uh, were godlike and magical in many ways. They had special powers. They never aged. They were often depicted as kings and queens and various other masters of craft. <laughs> The Tua were said to have descended Ireland in a cloud of mist uh, and ruled here for a very long time. I do eventually want to dive more into the Tua de Danann and make a whole extra video about that, but I'm hoping that that will come later in a more detailed video and that hopefully some internet friends will help me out with that. So I mean, you might be saying, Hannah, that's nice. We're getting a little bit off track here. Hold, bear with me, because the story of the Tua is and becomes the story of the Leprechaun. Because the Tua, as powerful as they were, were defeated in battle by a group of folks called the Milesians. Milesians? Now, even though the Milesians did defeat the Tua in a mythical battle, they were actually real people as well. I'm going to read this out because I don't want to mess it up. They featured in a book from the 11th century called the... Uh-oh. Labor, Labor Gabala Aaron sound off in the comments, fuck me up, or in English, the Book of the Taking of Ireland. Within Irish mythology, much like many other mythologies from all over the world, there is this kind of blending of the real and the mythical. Taking what is real or relevant, like a person, uh, much like the Milesians, and adding their actions in as mythological or supernatural in some way, such as defeating the Tua de Danann in battle for the ownership of the island of Ireland. You probably know this is seen in Roman mythology, Greek mythology, all over the world, and is actually still really prevalent in Ireland today. People will still blame things on the fairies and protect fairy sites and fairy circles. Anyway, by defeating the Tua de Danann in battle, the Milesians and therefore humans were now the new rulers and main inhabitants of the island of Ireland. But where did this leave the Tua? Good question, because the Milesians were actually very nice rulers, benevolent, that kind of thing, and they still allowed the Tua to live in Ireland with them, but less of like a cool, fun house sharing college kind of way, and more of a like, you get to live in a cave now kind of way. The Tua were driven underground, quite literally into caves, caverns, tunnels, and out of the sunshine, and out of the fresh air. This changed the Tua, and they were no longer as strong as they once were. They were no longer depictions of uh, beauty and perfection, and their powers started to change as well. Like a de-evolution into a sicker, weaker creature and subsect and race of species with a chip on their shoulder for humans, funny enough, which, fair enough. These devolved creatures took on different forms. The most common one you'll hear about is kind of the normal fairy type, a weaker, meaner, human-looking kind of creature whose main purpose is to make humans' lives miserable. These are the types of fairies that you should worry about. They can steal you away into their own world, change your concept of time. You could be kidnapped for weeks and weeks or even years, and it could feel like a matter of hours. They can even turn your clothes inside out on you. True story, although I'm pretty sure this one was just to try to explain to angry wives why you were coming home late from the pub with your clothes inside out. But, uh, you know, who am I? The Irish, however, don't always call them fairies, though, because it is believed that if you say their name, it will draw them towards you, and you don't want that. So they would call them things like the fair folk, the little people, the wee folk, the good neighbors, bit tongue-in-cheek with that one. I kind of like that one. But this is how they refer to them, so this way they don't call them into their lives. Oh, but Hannah, don't fairies have magic? Don't people want to harvest magic? And I've seen TikToks where you can call a fairy into your house. No, don't do that. Fairies don't like humans. We're the reason they're gross now. So here's kind of a gist of what fairies do in Ireland. I know we're getting off topic. I promise to swing back around. Fairies now, because they are weaker than humans physically and want to take back the island of Ireland, will do things like recruit humans and bring them into the world of the fairies to then strengthen the fairy race and get them ready for battle, that kind of thing. At least that's what I assumed the goal would be by stealing humans. But they don't just recruit and steal humans by like messaging you on your LinkedIn inbox or something because that would be too easy. What they do is they steal humans and replace them with a look-alike that's actually a fairy. 90% of the time these loved ones are babies and they are replaced by an identical looking 
fairy baby, also known as a changeling. These changelings are often sicker, weaker, thinner than your healthy, happy, fat baby that you just had. And that's how people would kind of know that their healthy human baby was replaced by a fairy. Now, if you're good with your mythology or you've watched John Solo, you might now just be realizing that this was usually used to explain things like sicknesses or disabilities, or if your baby started to not progress fully the way it was supposed to or hit all of its milestones. It's kind of a fill in the blank for anything that could go wrong that they don't know about. You know, your baby doesn't have a chromosomal disorder, it's a changeling. Your wife doesn't have dementia, she's been taken away by the fairies and replaced with somebody else. Your friend isn't fading away due to some invisible disease that you can't fix, he's been replaced. He's now in the fairy underworld having a great time and this fairy is actually the one that's dying. As dark as this is, hindsight is always 2020. All of these things are gonna seem very dark. While fairies offer a great explanation and maybe even a little bit of comfort to those who are mourning lost family members or dying family members. So like I said, fairies are a vast and complex topic that still have a very real presence in the Irish identity and the Irish kind of mythos that still exists today. But we're just gonna skim over this topic and refocus back on leprechauns. Sorry. So leprechauns are a type of fairy. There's a lot of different types of fairies, such as the Selkie, such as the Dillahan. If you want nightmares, you'll look for the Dullahan because it's even more scary than that movie that we all watched as millennials. <laughs> Fun fact, the Banshee is also a type of fairy in a way. Ban meaning woman and she meaning fairy. You can call fairies she or the little people she. So ban she just means woman fairy, interestingly enough. But the leprechaun more honestly is the least like harmful type of fairy that you could probably come across. He's not gonna replace your baby. He's not gonna try to kill anybody. He will probably just leave you dangling from your ankle outside of your own shed. Is more than likely what will happen. A fun story about the leprechaun, I'll tell you now because I learned this at the Leprechaun Museum. So if you're ever interested in learning more about leprechauns and Irish folklore and you're in Dublin and you don't want to be drinking the entire time you're here, you should take a look at the Leprechaun Museum. They're fucking great. Anyway, fun story about the leprechaun. Once upon a time, I'm not going to remember every single detail. Anyway, let's call this man John. John was out working in his field when he spotted, of course, but a little fucking man, a leprechaun. He's so cool. great. Now John was a regular guy middle class, probably poorer than usual. So he says, I'm gonna catch this leprechaun and I'm gonna make him give me his gold. Now, a leprechaun, tiny tidbits about leprechauns, they can't outright lie to you. They're not gonna be 100% honest, but they don't lie. And they can't not do what you ask them to do once you capture them. They have to do what you're asking them to do. There's always a loophole. So John catches this leprechaun and the leprechaun says, ah, dang it, <laughs> word for word, says you caught me. So John, says, all right, Leprechaun, take me, take me to where your gold is. And Leprechaun's like, ah, oh, puss, and John's like, ah, puss, you can't be lying to me, and you can't be trying to scootle out of this one, take me to your gold. So Leprechaun says, okay, fine, I'll take you to my gold, and then you let me go, I'll let you go. So the Leprechaun brings John all the way through this really large forest, he's going in, he's going further and further. He gets through one layer of trees, two layers of trees, he's in and out, he's in and out, and they're walking, and they're walking, and John's like, oh, jeez. And then all of a sudden he gets to a tree, normal looking tree, same as every other tree in the forest. And he says, all right, my gold is buried underneath this tree. And John goes, buried? It's buried? He says, yeah, it's buried. I buried my gold. St standard practice. So John says, oh, jeez, I didn't know it was buried. I would have brought my shovel. And Leprechaun says, well, a deal's a deal. He says, well, now I have to go back out and get my shovel and bring it back here and dig it up. And the Leprechaun says, okay. And John sits there and thinks, he goes, how am I gonna know which tree the gold is buried under? So he looks down and he sees he's wearing bright red socks that his wife made for him. Me, I'm his wife. He looks down, he says he's wearing bright red sock. He looks up at the leprechaun, he looks at the tree, he takes his sock off and he ties his sock around one of the branches of the tree. He turns to the leprechaun, he says, I'll let you go, but under these circumstances. And the leprechaun says, whatever. <laughs> you don't move your gold. And the leprechaun says, I won't, won't move my gold. He says, and you won't remove this sock from this tree. You'll leave it right where it is. The leprechaun says, yep, I won't move the sock. Sock stays, gold stays. He says, okay, you can go now. I'm gonna go get my shovel. I'm gonna come back to this spot. I'm gonna dig up your gold. Cool. Thanks. Disappears. Runs off. John hikes all the way back to his house, grabs his shovel, and hikes all the way back to the wood. Wife's like, hey, where's your sock? And he's like, not now, sweetheart. Ah! So he grabs his shovel, he goes back, and he hits the woods, and right as he gets to the edge of the woods, what's there? but a red sock tied around every branch of every single tree in the woods. Like I said, Leprechaun's not gonna outright lie. Leprechaun's not going to not do what you ask him to do. So technically speaking, the Leprechaun did leave the sock and he did leave the gold, but John is just as unlikely to find it as he ever is going to be. Le who? The her.
that's kind of the trickiness of the leprechaun, the overall gist of what you're going to get a leprechaun to do for you. Interestingly enough, the leprechaun actually didn't look like this when he started off. He actually looked more like this. A red jacket, more of a neutral tone, and the first mention of a leprechaun in Irish folklore, I want to get this right, was in a book called, uh-oh, Echtra Fergus McLetty, or The Adventures of Fergus, Son of Letty. I did not read this book, but the gist of it sounds like a lad went on a mad one, fell asleep under a tree, woke up to three leprechauns dragging him out to the sea. Which sounds pretty fair, uh, because nowadays you would get a dick drawn on your forehead. It's me, I'm gonna draw a dick on your forehead. Now, the original uh, name for the leprechaun was the something else. I'm gonna play it now. Ruhor Pain. In Legends and Stories of Ireland, written in 1831, Samuel Lover describes their outfits. He wears a red, square-cut coat, richly laced with gold, and the inexpressible of the same cocked hat, shoes, and buckles. So there are some similarities to what we're used to leprechauns wearing, but a totally different color palette. Now I know I keep saying that leprechauns were not as bad as other mythical creatures, but Irish folktales did depict them as ugly and mean. They were also typically shoemakers or that type of craftsman. They also kept their gold in pots or wares at the end of a rainbow. Very familiar. Now why did they do this? My initial thought was that because the end of a rainbow is quite elusive, and if you've ever tried to go to one, you'll know that it kind of disappears before you even really get there. Another tidbit from this book was that if you capture the leprechaun, they'll give you three wishes. Not sure if that still stands up in today's lore, but they will do what you say. These tidbits that are written out, though, were actually from a more modern book, from the 1978 book called An Encyclopedia of Fairies, Hobgoblins, Brownies, Bogies, and Other Supernatural Creatures by Catherine Briggs. Catherine Briggs Sounds like she'd be super fucking fun. Some lady in the 70s writing about fairies. I would like to be friends with you, Catherine Briggs. Hit me up. But when did this shift happen? When did leprechauns go from little ugly mean men in brown and red, making shoes and evading capture, to jolly little redheads? Because we all have that one friend that looks like a leprechaun. You know, that friend that looks like a leprechaun? Tag them down below. Now think about it. When does this shift always happen? How do we get from ugly, mean, folklore character to lovely, little, jolly, bouncy, happy thing. Oh, thanks for playing. If you said Disney, you're absolutely right. <laughs> Ireland is not immune to Disneyfication. The concept of taking a fairy tale that might not have been so child-friendly and swishing it up into something a little bit more palatable. For example, Snow White and Sleeping Beauty have S.A. in them and have included forced birth in one of them. Cinderella has her stepsister's toes cut off. The Little Mermaid dies at the end. Not to mention she is made to feel like a thousand knives are hitting her feet every time she takes a step with her new human feet. Frozen is based on the tale of a snow queen who gets mirror shards stuck in some kid's eye. Princess and the Frog is just gonna pretend racism in the Deep South wasn't going on in the 20s. And Aladdin was fine, and we're not gonna touch it. But Ireland had its own Disneyfication, don't you worry, with the 1959 film Darby O'Gill and the Little People. Disney thrust Ireland's quaint, beautiful countryside right into the limelight, and honestly, after watching the movie, not that bad. <laughs> not that bad. It's not 100% accurate, of course, with the folklore or the leprechaun aggression toned way down. And of course, the costume choice is decidedly more Irish toned and the addition of essentially the tricolor. And of course, in true Hollywood fashion, absolutely none of the actors are Irish. But in total, it doesn't throw too much shade on Ireland and it isn't too offensive in the way it portrays everything. It's not the worst depiction of Irish folks I've ever seen. I do highly recommend you watch the movie. It's very cute. It's kind of sweet from what I remember. The future James Bond serenading a young woman and an older fella getting carted off by leprechauns, only for nobody to believe him, obviously. He tells people that he knows the leprechauns and everybody goes, no, you fucking don't. But this is where we can pretty much definitively draw a line in the sand as to when leprechauns went mainstream in public media, especially Western media, American media, and where their new look came from. New media for leprechauns popped up in movies and TV shows. Irish folklore was gaining an audience with Western society. And based around the high numbers of Irish diaspora in these areas, they had a pretty wide fan base and a lot of people identifying with these old folklore that maybe they heard growing up. Here are some fun examples of stuff that I found that are great. There was a movie called Fenian's Rainbow with a character called uh, Og. Og the Leprechaun? If I get 100 likes on this video, so I'll force the lads down from my local pub to watch it with me. We also have the 1993 movie called Leprechaun starring Jennifer Aniston and Warwick Davis. Guess who he plays? <laughs> Just 
just wondering what episode of Friends that is. We also have the Celtics basketball team, a Boston-based NBA team. We have our boy Lucky. Oh my god. Uh, they're really after me lucky charms with this one. I know that this guy's like a weird joke to Irish people, but this was truly for us American kids in the 90s and early 2000s, the most popular depiction of a leprechaun that there ever was. You say leprechaun and Saturday morning millennials will think lucky charms man. It's like a Schrodinger's reaction at this point. Notre Dame College has the fighting Irish football team. And of course my all-time favorite ridiculous example, Disney's other Irish film, The Luck of the Irish. Now I don't even need a hundred likes on this video. I will eventually force some Irish people to watch this movie with me. It is guaranteed because it's so goddamn wild. Hey. I used to be taller than you. Oh, sins preserve us. I am getting shorter. There's something your mother and I need to tell you, son. Kyle. This movie naturally stars no Irish people, makes no effort to research any part of Irish folklore or mythology, appropriates every single piece of the Irish culture, and somehow still makes my funny bone tickle after 20 years of this movie being out. The luck of the Irish, a kid one day, and a leprechaun the next. When I tell you this movie played on the Disney Channel every single St. Patrick's Day in the early 2000s, and it ended with a custom rendition of This Land is Your Land by the characters in the movie. This land was made for you and me, that endless skyway. This land was made for you and me. Oh my god. That, this was a cultural shift and it was so fucking funny. I can't even tell you what it's about. It's about, if I say it, it's gonna be offensive. This is gonna be flagged. It's about a kid in America who finds out he's a leprechaun after he loses his good luck charm that his mom gave him when he was a baby. So he starts to evolve into a leprechaun and gets smaller and smaller, and his mom also becomes a leprechaun. I am a leprechaun! And his grandpa also becomes a leprechaun, and in order to get his good luck charm back, he needs to fight a bigger, stronger leprechaun in a basketball battle. I swear to God, drugs. Some, some sort of drug went on in the Disney room. They were like, I got an idea. I've heard of Ireland once. Let's do it. Yeah, let's watch that together at some point. Now, <sighs> sorry, on to the weird accusations. The ever so viral Leprechaun are pygmies video that went pretty wide and far on TikTok. Oh, hey, Hannah. Yes. Aren't you a little late with this topic? Better late than a few years ago, right when every single person in the world got it on TikTok, there was an American woman who went viral for saying something a little bit wild, and a lot of people actually read pretty far into it. The pygmy tribe of Africa were considered your leprechaun. Now I'm gonna start reading off of my notes here just to make sure that I don't miss anything because these can be kind of delicate topics that she was covering. She opened with the relevant and current topic, origins of current events that are actually based in colonialism and effectively racism. This is important stuff for sure. But then she says that uh, one of the holidays that is founded in anti-African sentiment is actually St. Patrick's Day. And then she explains why. She explains that pygmies were actually the original inhabitants of the island of Ireland. She said that they were killed off or driven out via the St. Patrick's story. You know the story where St. Patrick drove the snakes out of Ireland. She's saying that those were pygmies and she offers the explanation that pygmies were the snakes because they used to wear snakes as their headdresses and that the pygmies are now known as the leprechauns of Ireland because of their small stature. She then explains that St. Patrick drove the pygmies out of Ireland, thus explaining the snake story and also the leprechaun thing. And to be honest, this seems to match up a little bit if we're not looking too hard, but let's dive in because it's not real. Oh, spoiler alert. Now this led to a little bit of hesitation surrounding the jolliness of St. Patrick's Day and leprechauns and had people kind of second guessing it. And it actually put Ireland under the microscope in terms of the critical race discussions that were starting to happen that year. With the very much necessary conversations that were starting to happen in all corners of the internet that year, I think it was absolutely important. And Ireland as a European nation started to get scrutinized with the same lens as a previously colonizing country like let's say the UK, Belgium, or the United States. Now this is super important to do. Ireland was never a colonizer. It never colonized a country outside of just moving there in droves. The investigation into Ireland kind of cooled off a little bit. And I'm gonna read this sentence off so this way I get it right. And while it is true that Ireland never had enough of a black presence within the country to have a history of systemic racism, the permeating cultural norms of places like the USA and England still do affect the country today. This is not me saying that Ireland is immune to having chats and conversations about improving the experience of the black communities here. In fact, I think now more than ever, Ireland needs to come into the conversation. 
However, I do believe that this conversation will be very different from the conversation in the United States. As Ireland has never colonized and never enslaved, this conversation will focus more on the modern experience. Thank you for bearing with me on that. Pop culture depictions of black people, uh, representation of other races and stereotypes in modern media do inform the public opinion here, as they do everywhere. However, Ireland being a very small country in between the US and the UK and with allyships to the US and the UK, the pervasive media influence here is dominantly reflective of British and American media. So that's to say that Ireland does get affected by the racial stereotypes and depictions that are in popular media. But when it comes to the history of uh, African immigration into the island of Ireland, this is fairly recent. It's just now in the past 50 to 100 years or so that Ireland has honest to goodness immigration into the country that isn't a colonization or a military occupation. So a lot of the racial diversity that we enjoy here in Ireland today is fairly recent, one or two generations back. Now I do have a lot more to say on this topic, as does everybody I would assume, but we'll refocus on leprechauns and we'll make sure that we give this topic a real video um, that it deserves. Also, I don't want people to think that I'm implying that there were no black folks in Ireland beforehand or before 100 years from now. That's absolutely not true. There absolutely were. But if we're talking numbers, we just are seeing more as we go along further and further into the future, increasing. Now that was a tangent. I am sorry. But as you can tell, probably uh, from here that I am not black. So if you're looking for more resources of black folks in Ireland and the Irish experience for black folks, there are some resources you can see. So here's some. There are great content creators and figures in this community. So one is Bonnie Adoamene, apologies, or Bon Bon OD14. And then my own personal favorite is the Black and Irish podcast. I found these guys during the pandemic and they've got some really incredible episodes. One that I found is about systemic racism, season two, episode nine. They have a few guest speakers on there and they do talk about systemic racism and racial uh, experience in Ireland. All of those creators will be linked down below. You can find them. Uh, they've got way bigger followings than I do, so take a look and you'll find them. So now that you've heard about critical race theory in Ireland from a white American, it's time to move forward with the intended topic of this video, leprechauns. Let's debunk this lady and what she's talking about. As we have just discussed, the leprechaun is a fairy, part of Irish culture that goes back for thousands of years. The events that this person is talking about would have only been a couple of hundred years old. And actually she provided a picture and this picture couldn't have been any older than the mid 1800s since the camera was invented in 1826. So they couldn't have taken a picture of any pygmies with Irish folks in Ireland pre-St. Patrick because there was no way to do that. Not sure where this picture is from. If you know where this picture is from, please let me know. Another factor to consider is the snake point. If the pygmies had snakes on their headdresses, where do they come from? There is no archeological evidence to suggest that snakes were ever on the island of Ireland in history. So if they did have them, where do they come from? Where are these snake decorative headdresses coming from? Not from Ireland. So if they were here in Ireland, did they get them from their original inhabitation place, potentially Africa, and bring them to Ireland? Were these pygmies migrating? Like I said, I'm not formally educated in any of this, so all of this is potentially possible. However, it is very unlikely that that did happen. Like I said, there were never any real snakes in Ireland. Sorry, friends, my SIM card filled up and I had to delete a bunch of stuff. Where did we leave off? All right, so probably where we left off was the real story of St. Patrick and the snakes. So unfortunately, the snake story is just as dark as what this woman was probably talking about, but it doesn't have anything to do with pygmies or any African culture. It has to do with the inhabitants of Ireland, unfortunately. So most likely the allegory on this story is that St. Patrick did drive out people, but it was most likely Christians or non-pagans that St. Patrick was driving out of Ireland, either via exiting or other unaliving type situations that were going on. So yes, there was a driving out of snakes, but it wasn't the pygmies. It was most likely just non-Christians. So unfortunately, although this would make a very cool dark history deep dive, Bailey Sarian, it's not real. And Ireland has more of a connection to various countries in Africa today than it ever did in the past. For example, the only other country who manufactures Guinness at this time is Ghana. They make my favorite Guinness, which is the Guinness Foreign Extra, and it's delicious. And they also have a very big connection with Ireland. A lot of the people there have Irish names. Uh, and there's an allyship with Ghana that continues on today. So Ghana also has a tradition of naming their children Irish names, has an allyship that has resulted in many diplomatic visits, and has allowed Irish people to taste seasoned food for the first time in their entire lives. So I think that's pretty special. So that, my friends, is the story of a leprechaun in a nutshell, a former god with a small man complex who is gonna do his best to ruin your day. A Disney character that started off weird and is now a little bit more normal, but definitely not a pygmy. Unfortunately, no leprechauns were available to interview for this video, but if you know any leprechauns or you have a friend that looks like one, 
Like I said, tag them down below. But the most important thing here is that it starts a conversation. Leave comments on what you thought, other stories that you might have grown up with on leprechauns, or anything that you might have that might educate me on certain topics that you've heard. So if there's anything that you want to add to the conversation, please do, because this is for you to talk about. Leave any suggestions of other topics that you might want me to cover. All of my sites that I use are down in the description box. Any of the handles that you've heard me talk about of the creators are in the description box. And if you want to see me finish this up and hang it on my balcony, stick around. It should look cool eventually. Fingies crossed. Anyway, I love you. Like and subscribe. Holy shit. Please. Thank you. Like I said, hopefully these will be getting more regular and I will see you in the next one. Love you. Bye. 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 This is not big enough to cover this. Oh, hold on. Wait, got it. There you go. Bye. Yeah, welcome back to my balcony. I finished this. I also made this. You can find this for sale on my website as well. It's the lemon lime jumper. I gotta be adding some buttons and stuff, but it's very cute. It's like a cropped lemon lime, Amalfi Coast, Aperol, Spritz. I'm... I think, or it's just a nonsense jumper that I made myself because I wanted to. But I finished the bunting. Uh, it's very cute, and now we're going to hang it up. It is leprechaun themed, at least new age leprechaun themed. It's a tricolor. So I'm gonna try to hang it up up here. Hopefully it looks as cool as I'm picturing it in my head. Okay. We're gonna do it on the other wall. I think it would look cooler. Hold please. All right, let's try this one. I think it'll look cuter because it's just a black brick wall that I painted. It was a shitty yellow color. And if you have hung out with me in real life, you know the term renter's yellow. It's like a shitty beige yellow color that is everywhere um, in rental units over here. And I had to destroy it before it took over the world because I hate it so much. I would rather paint it neon green than renter's yellow. Anyway, let's see how this looks. Also, if you're renting, these are your best friends. You probably know what they are. They're the little wall stickies, the little command hooks. Stick them on everything. 10 out of 10. And now we're the most festive house in town. Hope you enjoyed that video. Thanks for sticking around and watching me nearly fucking throw myself off a balcony. Love you. Uh, like and subscribe, please. Holy shit. Bye. The lemon lime jumper if you want to. I could also make you one of those if you DM me. I'll probably put it up on the website. I can be bought. There's a price for everything, and my price is fairly low. I have absolutely no pride or self-worth. So, um, anyway, I'm selling my soul on the internet. Uh, like and subscribe to see the rest of it. Bye. Everything you see here is made by me. The outfit, the bunting, all this crap behind me. Uh, I'll accept the dog, he's adopted because I was unable to conceive a dog myself. Leprechauns, where's my crochet hook? Uh-oh, crisis averted. One, two, three, four, five, six. Right fucking here in this chick. No, that's done. 18, 19, 20. Oh, perfect. The Malaysian, Malaysian, you hear my dog drinking water? Yucky ASMR. Sorry, I'm getting more and more tired as I look at my computer. And it's, I'm, it's user error, let's just put it that way. Fingies crossed, right?